<laughs> Good morning. That just made me happy. Just made me happy. So um, what else makes me happy? Hello, Roger and Bobby. Yeah. Yeah. Another piece of the story. Welcome home. So, we, um, we're moving together, up, 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 to a higher place, aren't we? Roger stayed and um, fought the fire to save his property and save some other homes and took courage. And we all face that fire in a different way, facing where what we were called into our own way of action or uh, what, what it was. And so, Roger, are you doing okay? Good, up, up, yeah. So, um, before I, the art from ashes that Kathy Rao, who lost her home, has been doing, uh, please spread that word if you know people. This is some of the artifact that she found in her ashes. And what's particularly interesting is the alchemy of the center little uh, white Buddha now. It was a uh, jade. Now it's white. Interesting. Interesting. And some of the pieces look absolutely untouched. They've still got their polish on it. Uh, it was a worry stone. And a little clay figure, not a mark on her. And then another little symbol of, um, that was on a pot that uh, just shows a Native American still weaving a new way. So wonderful pieces, wonderful pieces. And many people are, are discovering that as they, they explore what was one thing is now transformed into something else. And, and so they're going to display this in art. So pass that word around and, and let people know. And you can find it on Facebook. The group is called um, Art from the Ashes uh, Number Car Fire. So a nice way to, to offer back. They're going to do a fundraiser with that. And I just I want to promote that because it helps the healing. It helps the healing to see, to see what, what, this, what this fire is transforming in all of us, right? And the music was fun. I appreciate the, the upliftment of, of your music because we need that as well. And so we're talking today about um, affirmations and denial. And actually, denial and affirmations because affirmations should always follow denials. <laughs> How embarrassing that I said it backwards. Because, um, and I'll explain a little bit more about what that means. But I thought it was sort of humorous, I thought, okay, I'm going to read you what Ernest Holmes wrote in the Living the Science of Mind. So if you get this, if you catch it, you can just walk on out of here. You just say, I got it. <laughs> Are you ready, Ernest Holmes? Just one paragraph. The practitioner deals with that which is and not with that which is not. Therefore, when the that which is appears in the form of negation, even this negation is part of the activity of that which is, but is a wrong use of it. This wrong use of that which is implies no negation of that which is, no separation from that which is, and no disunity with that which is. It implies merely a negative use of it. Hence, the practitioner never deals with the negative as though it were a thing itself. It is but a state of consciousness. I No. So I'm like, you know, sometimes when you're tired and you're reading this stuff, going, <laughs> well, I can't, I got to start back all over again. Page one, the thing itself. So interesting, interesting. But um, it's a great chapter in Living the Science of Mind, and it's under uh, the, the work with, with the affirmative uh, power of prayer. And, but really, it really speaks to something that, that as I, I looked at this over the last couple of weeks, I'm going, you know, it's really important. It's so important to look at what is before our good. What is, what is in front of that which we are longing for? What's in front of it? Why, why is it made manifest just because I said my word? Well, because we have smoke screens of belief systems that are dwelling still within us 
And what we demonstrate is in our world what, what is the outcome, the outpicturing, what we are living in our experience, in our thoughts and feelings, all of it, even in the material world, is all based on what we have um, built upon the platform of our belief system. And we, have, we speak to this, but it is so integral to understand what belief is holding me from my good. What is that? Can I name that? And it's buried down in the subconscious. At the retreat last week, we did a lot of deep work on this. And uh, we were with some women up in Bellingham. And, and it was I, our question before everyone was, what has followed you around for your lifetime and just recurred in, in different stories? And, and everybody's going, oh, we have to go that deep? <laughs> you know. and, and they were willing. And so the processes of that um, really help to reveal, reveal what's in the way. And then once you see it, you can deny that it has any power over you. It has no more power over you when you can name it, hold it, um, offer it up, offer it to the ash, and let it go. So um, I invite you as I, as I w work through this, this information to share with you the other book that they're referring to in the whole organization is John Waterhouse's book on five steps of freedom and it's a, a little tiny book all about the treatment, all about processing uh, prayer, affirmative prayer. And this particular, why this step is so important, we kind of get that part like God is and we kind of think, yeah, God is. And that really we allow ourselves to, to name our good, to name, to name our God. Uh, is it love? Is it you know, what is that mystery? What is that? And so we get to name that and makes it very personal. And when we've been able to name it, we say that is, I am that, I am that. And so those first two steps are qualifying that. Now, if, you, if you're real clear there, that's all you need. That's all you need for the rest of your life. God is and I am and I'm moving forward. But then there's the part that we're trying to work on some of issues um, I love what you have to offer, Frankie, and I finally can be there this Friday. I want to look like Frankie in a girl's way. And so I'm going to wear a little tank top and be really cute. No, I won't. Please come. I won't do that. <laughs> but, um, yeah. But all these tools, all these tools, and it's a diligent way. It is a way to find the happiness and the truth that we desire and we deserve. So what's in the way of that? And through, it is through spiritual practice, through breath work, through, through deep listening, through journaling, through soul work, to find the, the deep um, awareness and find that harmony, find that pathway. And so these, these steps, these are the, f the middle part of your prayer is, is where you start to really work on declaring, declaring that truth for you. And there's four, he's, the four essential steps that Waterhouse brings forward in this is uh, when we know the truth of spirit in the absolute, we realize the same truth applies to us. So we've got that first two steps. It must be personal. Okay, so our words need to be so personal. They need to be in your language. They need to be, they need to have the, the soul vibration of, of your words, your work, your life. We can't um, get ex all that we need. We get so much information from all of the resources, but until we digest it into our own words, it's still just words coming to us. And then when we can articulate it into our own language, we will know this truth applies to us deeply in a very personal, deep way. We have to be totally present, he says. We must know that spirit is the creative cause and it's operating right here, right now, through us, as us. And as we recognize this, we get a sense of straightening up into that positivity of this declaration of truth. And we, that's why it's called the affirmative prayers. We start to realize, I'm focusing on the good. But in that, in that little piece right there can rise a small doubt. It can, it can be subtle. But the invitation is for you in your deep prayer is to have silence of your soul in such a way that even that, even that murmuring, even that whisper, do you really believe this? 
And you can say, no, I'm not really worth it, but I believe it for everybody else. No. Let's not leave it there. You say, even though I feel unworthy, I know the divine worth within me as me because I am that I am. You see, you deny, you deny that, that still voice that just kind of shatters your awakening, shatters your truth from being totally manifest. It's such a key component, that denial, and then you follow it with something grand, with an affirmation of, of such glory, of such, such truth, that suddenly you really are in harmony with the divine, with the words spoken. And then you want it to be precise in such a way that it reflects your thoughts, reflecting your thoughts, reflecting. And again, there's that stillness in your practice, your prayer. If this is such divine time. Wake up in the morning and do your prayers. Wake up in the night and do your prayers. Throughout the day, do your prayers. Pray unceasingly, pray unceasingly, because we have this um, landscape of experiences. Uh, we've downloaded so much material and some of it is not useful, but we just kind of let it lay dormant. But our pathways, our thinking goes to that as habit. It just goes there, it's magnetic goes there, but unless we turn and look at it and smooth away that pathway, take our, our spiritual hoe and just move the margins and say, even though this, is, this doubt, this ugly doubt is rising in me, I know a greater truth because God is greater than all that is. My God is greater than all that is. Whatever personal way you can precisely allow this truth to be spoken to, to direct the course of your life so that those steps in the declaration in the middle of your prayer, because all good is revealed through our recognition of it as by the spoken word. Thou shalt decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee. What does decree mean? Thou shalt decree a word. Well, what is your word? What words are you using? What's your language? As you look at this, what is the idea? Am I in divine thinking or I, am I in idle thinking? Am I allowing myself to go back, 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 instead of up, up, up to that higher place? All of, the, all of the research, all of the study, all that's going on today is pointing scientifically to these neural pathways and to this luminous light that we are. We believe in that. We see that. We feel that. We walk in that light. And all of the experience of, this, of the fire, if it wasn't so frightening, even though the fire is frightening, I look at the awe and the massiveness of its, of its glory, of its flame, of its brightness. Have you looked at it without fear? It, it's like, it's a light that we've never seen before. And can we be willing to be humbled in the power and recognize, okay, it's almost as if there is, in so many traditions, there's the Kali, the destroyer in the Hindu tradition. And there's this, this Shiva that destroys that which is, and it's massive and it's greater. And as we, we realize there is that force too. There's this force of, of, of something greater that can change what has been to an alchemy of something greater. And when we allow our focus to say it's a greater good, I'm going to remind you of a practice, and this practice is so profound. Um, I'll, I'll remind you, and again and again, time to time, I want you to think right now of something. Just look down and towards the ground and think of some woe that you've had recently, some trouble, just kind of whatever it is, not to bring you down, but just to go there for a moment. Just what is that? You kind of you just notice your thoughts. Notice what your heart feels when you're just looking down into to, to what has been. And then you raise your gaze and you're looking out into it and you speak it again, something changing. But you're looking at the story and then 
And McCurtis Hopkins asks you, look up. Look up to where a ceiling line joins the wall and think of it again. Now notice what you feel. Up, up, up to a higher place. There is a truth revealed on that higher ground when we allow ourselves to look up to the greater good, not cast down into the reptilian brain area of the fright and flight, though it's important to, to recognize that, to move yourself, to motivate yourself out of danger, but then take it up and look up. Everyone testifies almost always about how it sort of loses its grip when I take the time to look up into that greater good. So this is the divine idea. This is the divine idea versus the idle thinking down into the muck of it. And you say, in a perfect way, in a perfect way, whatever I'm experiencing, in a perfect way, this is resolving itself in a perfect way, this or something better, this or something better. Now, oftentimes, in affirmations, I remember we were doing um, Stetton, Stetton Smith's workshop, and you had to do uh, like 50 I, I am prosperous affirmations in the morning and 50 in the afternoon and 50 at night. And so I, I became, I don't know why it became, I am prosperous, I am, I am prosperous. I don't know what, something happened to my voice. I started channeling this, you know, other culture inside of me. I am prosperous, I am, I am, I am. And then with, with that though, that was part of kind of reset our consciousness. And at first it was like, eh, corny. Oh, boring, but then pretty soon, like, oh, I didn't do them. I am prosperous, I am prosperous, I am prosperous. And then there was a part in the workshop where you had to declare, what do you want to make for the year? And I remember putting a number out there. And doggone it, if we weren't doing our taxes, that we didn't make that number. And I thought, I didn't ask for more. <laughs> but I also did not ask in that, in that, um, treatment for more money for my for my well uh, my abundance flow to to see this in operation I forgot the part that I don't want to have to work that hard for it and I was working recovery room and I got on call so many t so much that's why I made so much that year and I thought no that that's not the way I want to do it I don't want to be on call and uh, that's not it so there's this way that you say this or something better right so you don't d dictate or define it so much, but you're open to that good. And so there was many stories of that where somebody said, all I need is, is 600, and then they, they get that, they get that exact amount, and then they find out that the next gift was gonna be 1,000, but you took the 600. So there's all these kind of mysterious stories around um, when you look at it as your abundance in the form of money. So we're trying to enlarge whatever our experience is, whatever has been within our consciousness. What is your mold? What is your uh, mental equivalent? What are you, uh, by divine design, creating for yourself? And what do you want to receive in a larger way? And sometimes it's just fun to go pretend. To pretend you're so darn rich that you're in, Charlie and I did this once, we went to Telluride and we went to one of the finest um, hotels there where all the rich movie star people were. He's just like, oh wow, look over there, look over there. And I was like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not dressed right. But he's having, a, he's having the time of his life. Now I wish I had that opportunity again just to walk in like, yeah, I'll take a glass of water. And just, <laughs> just act like I own the place. But, you know, how, there it is, see? What I'm pointing to is the little way, so subtle, so subtle, here's our good, here's a building, a lobby to walk into, and how do you, how do you work with that? What is your mind telling you? So watch what limits you. This is the way into the subconscious. You, you find that, and then you deny that, and then you affirm the truth about it. So as doing that again and again, the limitations begin to crumble and your experience because they cannot stand. Those denial, those things that you think are in your way, they cannot stand up to the divine light. That light, that luminous power, that divine super consciousness is so much more powerful than the 
idea that you're holding and containing. So you want to see what's in yourself first. Deny it if it's impeding your way. Check in with yourself, the spiritual practice. Touch it. And then ask yourselves, because you have to believe yourself. You just, you, you can't just skip over it and think, okay, it won't bother me again. No, it goes back, it just dives right back into your subconscious. You want to see the potentiality and the possibilities. So when you speak your truth there, then you have to watch, okay, this is, this is going to be made manifest, and I don't think so. Yeah, it's impossible. Okay, what can you believe? What can you believe? Little by little, what can you believe? You've got um, a diagnosis that's, that's frightening to you. You take it piece by piece. And it, 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 the big word, cancer, comes, and you go, hmm, what are my possibilities here? What do I fear? And you listen. Okay, what is, what's, a, what's a possible way to, to hold this a little bit differently that I can really resonate with? And you build it. And you build it. And you breathe with it. And it becomes a new belief that I am stronger than that. That there is treatment for me. You know, whatever it is. And I accept that. It's coming to me now. It's mine now. And you begin to claim it. Instead of holding back in fear and just hoping hope this goes away. And that's a slower process, because it'll go away maybe not in this lifetime. So you want to look at, at the ways that you are adding to, and what, is, what are the things that are pulling you? What is pulling you? What is leading your way? And you want to start to begin to, to see yourself on the other side. There's a story of how we how we look at things. And there was a story from the French um, legend that uh, gives an example of this. And a poor man was walking along a road when he met a traveler who stopped him and said, my good friend, I see that you are poor. Take this gold nugget, take this gold nugget, sell it, and you will be rich for all your days. Well, the man overjoyed, you see, overjoyed with his good fortune. He took the nugget home and he immediately found work. And he became so prosperous that he did not sell the nugget. And years passed. He became a very rich man. And one day, he met a poor man on the road. And he stopped and said, oh, my good friend, do I have something for you? I will give you this gold nugget, nugget in which, which, if you sell it, will make you rich for life. And so the, the man took the nugget, had it valued, found it was only brass. So you see, the first man did not doubt that he was given gold. So we can be given uh, scriptures that we go, yes, that's mine, I live by that, I abide by that. Then we can get another scripture and go, hmm, I don't know, I don't know if that's gonna work. I don't know. And so that's what is revealed. We, become, we take what was gold and it becomes brass. So it's just, it's so subtle, so, so quick and always, always a call for us to, to see what in my life is truly the gold here. What, what am I changing by a reverse alchemy into, into a place of suffering? And then if I see that, I can name it, deny it, and affirm what I truly desire. So affirming establishes the belief in subconscious. I think I've, I've really expressed that here through, through Ernest Holmes' words that, that uh, Damien read to you. And it's easier in an abstract when we can think about it until you're confronted with some of your stuff, right? When you're confronted with your stuff, you're going, whoa, not working now. Yes, it is. It's working now because it's revealed to you. And so there's your, there's your gold nugget. It's been handed to you. Take it. It's yours. It's a rich gift to transform your way of thinking. There's another... Uh, story here, a man was spending the night in a farmhouse and the windows of the room had been nailed down and in the middle of the night he felt suffocated. And he made his way in the dark to the window and he could not open it so he smashed the pane and with his fist drew in draughts of fine fresh air and had a wonderful night's sleep. The next morning he found he had merely smashed the glass of a bookcase and the window had remained closed during the whole night. 
he had really truly only supplied himself with oxygen simply by his thought of oxygen. You see the, the power of the mind and how we can be trapped and yet how we can be set free at the same time. I think these stories in their, way, in their subtle ways are so powerful in their simplicity to remind us where we can go, never to give up and never to compromise, never to turn back on your prayers, to stand in a truth and wait until the divine grace is washing over you. You can demonstrate. Demonstrating is, is seeing what's happened, actively standing in your truth and seeing oh, the truth being revealed to you and knowing what you've released. We let go. We stop reasoning and bargaining with God in such a way, trying to control, like, well, if you did it this way, God, perfect. No, just lay it down. Go into the depth, speak your truth as honestly and authentically as you can, and then allow that divine intelligence to work freely through you, as you, around you, above you, through you, as you, and, all, and then all people on your path are affected by that grace moving through you. This is what it means to be a divine being living in a human experience. This divine truth is the absolute. The human condition is that which we apply to it. And that is filled with belief and thought. And we can work with that. We have the tools. Get clear on what you don't want and know clearly what you do want. Write it down, define it, journal it. Reveal it until you can create an absolute mental equivalent. And as you transform your mind, you're allowing the spirit to flow through you, and that's what we want. So many times, haven't you felt like, you know, I just don't feel like getting up today. Oh, boy, here goes my feet on the ground. Ooh, crink, crink, crunch. Oh, I'm up. And then you forget about it. You're moving through your day. How are you? I'm fine. Great. Good day. Mm, air's a little clearer. Oh, wait a minute, I woke up suffering. What happened to that suffering person? You know, it's, it's this way of the divine taking control over you to move you through and to, and to operate in your day, to transform, transform yourself so spirit can flow. Energy, and we can feel this, energy is always getting stuck. Think about this through competition. Notice when you're competing, even if it's just a card game, I lost. <laughs> Or I won, yeah. or I tie, I love ties. I don't know, the world is right with a tie. Control, when you're trying to control things, when you're dealing with impatience, ego, self-grandizement, guilt, guilt. Can you feel the flow just go, oh, there's, there's my guilt spot. Shame, I often speak to shame because it shows up in your fanny. That's, a, that's an okay word to say on tape. Because oftentimes, shame just kind of hides. It just bunches up there like you're about to get a spanking. I have shame. Yes, you do. Let it go. And oh, what's that story as you let your fanny go? Try, try it. Try it in the shower. So there's, there's pain. When we have pain, what is this pain? It's stopping my flow. I'm, I'm confined around it. My unworthiness. My God, this one, this unworthiness one. I know it, and it breaks my heart because I, I can, it lives in me, but I know it lives in so many. And when they speak it to me, I just want to cradle them as if I was the Divine Mother saying, no, 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 you're so worthy. Can I say that to myself, even though I have to, I have to, I have to cradle this, this divine self in me asked me to know the worthiness of the divine. This sense of lack or victimization, addiction, another confinement to the divine flow, anxiety, confusion, pain, and trauma, one of the worst. Trauma. I find that one, all I can do with people in deep trauma is want to take it from them. Let me take a piece, let me carve a piece out, put it over here. Can you feel the flow? Can you see that I love you so dearly? Let's take that. And that's what we can do for one another in those deep trauma moments. 
So the idea from Ernest Holmes is the argumentative and the realization of this. So we argue that which we feel can't possibly be. We're going to argue with that until we realize a greater truth, until we feel the luminous light, until we've spoken it in such a way that this is revealed that we are now once again harmonious with the divine. Now, I love the way that sounds, just being in harmony with the divine. It's a dance. It's what we see when we, it's what we feel when we are there. Emma says, Emma Curtis Hopkins says, the idea of the absence, the idea of absence protests against this denial. They were working on that idea to, to really uproot it, to really see that. And I mentioned in the nine o'clock service, her spiritual practice was before you could take a class, you had to spend 30 days before looking at all, doing all your denial work to find what's in your way. I offer that to you. Journal it. When, I, when you speak the words, whatever in one of those words, um, guilt, shame, pain, unworthiness, whatever those words, fear, anxiety, whatever kind of goes, oh, that's mine. Whoop, that's not. Oh, thank God that one's not mine. But the ones that are, the ones that kind of give you a burp, you want to try to look at that a little bit deeper and say, I'm going to work on that denial. Even though I feel that, I know, and you claim a greater good. That's the important part. You affirm that goodness. So we don't want the inertia of our thought patterns to cause our mind to speak back or argue our good. We want these, this mental activity to cause the shift. And so I'm just going to close, and, and I'll have Judy come up, and, and we'll do a little practice here. Because when you come to a practitioner, they're already working in that state of deep knowing your absolute truth. They see you as the perfection and the luminous body, and it is yours to tell the story of what's in the way. And so we, we work with that until the mind is satisfied, the mind is clear. And we allow this activity of the mind to destroy the negative thoughts. And what is left? What is left when you destroy the negative thought? Perfection. Perfection, motivation, love love for humanity itself. So as she, as she plays, I want you to, to think about, just kind of close your eyes and just check in with yourself. Get yourself really comfortable in your body. Get yourself in a place where no longer are these words coming at you, but you're starting to embody a greater truth. You're starting to recognize that the divine is all that there is. And you're practicing the, the, the affirmations in such a way that what was once there is released, is unstuck. And the power of this knowing as you declare first, God is all that there is. And as I allow myself to be held in this truth, I recognize my alignment, I recognize my connection and all suffering is released. And as I speak my word here from Erna, Emma Curtis Hopkins, her words, here is my mind. I release old beliefs. Give to me, give to me for its foolishness and ignorance, bright wisdom. Give to me bright wisdom. Here is my life. I released my old patterns. Give for its contrariness, true and everlasting life. Here is my heart. It lives in the one. Forgive it, its restlessness and dissatisfaction, its resentments and discouragement. Forgive its attractions and its hates, its hopes and its fears. Give eternal love for all of these. Here is my body. I release old images. Give for its imperfection your sweet perfection. Forgive me altogether. Give in return for my old sense of self. Give me my God self so I may be life so I may be the inspiration for all. So be it, I give thanks, I am clear, 
I am the divine. I am one. I give thanks. I take a breath. Do I feel it? Do I feel it? That which I can name and that which I can release. That which I am. I accept. I give thanks. I release. I let go. Together we all say, and so it is. Really? Really? And so it is. And then again, it's so it is. 